Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. And today I thought I'd start maybe a new series called What I'm Learning. The reason I had this idea was actually a friend of mine told me how cool would it be if he could actually stock everything I was reading and learning about for the day or the week. Like he felt like he would learn a lot from that. So I thought it'd be kind of a fun idea and maybe be an idea for a series of more casual videos. So let me know what you think about that. Also, when I was growing up, whenever I read something or I told my dad I'd read a book or an article, he'd say in Russian, of course, so it's going to sound a little strange. So what did you learn about the thing that you read about? And I'd have to kind of tell him the insights that I gained from that reading. So maybe this video is also be a way for me to share those things and actually tell you my insights and kind of replicate that. So let me know if you like this kind of video and if it's interesting to you and maybe this will continue as a series. So the first thing I've been reading this week is a blog post by Scott Young called How to Research. Scott Young is one of my favorite authors and he often collaborates with another one of my favorite authors named Cal Newport. And a lot of you have called out this book in my background. Uh, it's not here right now, but Cal Newport wrote Deep Work and So Good They Can't Ignore You, which I really love and I follow his blog for a long time. Scott Young actually gained popularity when he took the MIT OpenCourseWare CS degree in under one year and took all the courses for free. And I thought that was really interesting and obviously him and Cal Newport collaborate a lot together on learning and research and stuff like that. So then Scott Young actually continued doing all these learning projects and actually wrote a book called Ultra Learning, which is also one of my favorites and I have that. And he's been doing a lot of learning projects since then. And his projects really extend to many domains. So it wasn't just computer science and technical work, but he's also learning many different languages. So anyway, I subscribe to his blog and read pretty much every article that he sends out. And this one came out, How to Do Research. And this was really interesting to me as well because someone actually commented on my YouTube video recently asking how I actually research my videos and how I organize those videos. So first, he makes a really great point about research because it's kind of hard to know when you're done with research because research is unbounded. You can go as deep as you want or as shallow as you want. The work never ends until you say, yes, this is enough. I'm done with this. I'm satisfied with the outcome. So for me, when I'm doing YouTube videos, this is something I had to learn as well. When am I going to be done with this YouTube video? So my process is I usually start with the script writing and I'm trying to answer a certain question and I have to put it that way to make it a little more bounded. Otherwise, I'm going to keep writing and writing. And sometimes I get to a point where a video is like 20 to 30 minutes long and I realize there's so much more left to go. Or sometimes I go too deep into a certain field, get really frustrated, not really understand how I was connecting back to my video and kind of drop this video. And I have a lot of half done essays because of this that I haven't made into videos yet because I can't figure out what question I'm answering. So when he talks about research and how to organize things, this is how I approach YouTube videos. I try and figure out when it is done. What question am I answering in my video? So am I comparing quantum cryptography and post quantum cryptography and how deep do I want to go on each one? And you know, I can't cover all of quantum hardware in just 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, but what are some pieces that I can pull? What are those frequently asked questions and how deep do I want to get? So sometimes when I'm making these videos, I first want to do an overview video and then say, maybe I did a video on quantum hardware, which I did in the past. I'll link that here. But I say, here's kind of the hardware modalities. This is how I'm going to compare them. And later on, then I can make a video focusing on maybe one of the modalities like superconducting qubits or neutral atoms or something like that and go much, much deeper. That way, this stops the video from exploding because obviously people do whole PhDs on quantum physics, which means that's 10 years of total schooling. You know, it's hard to put that into a 10 and 15 minute video. And because my focus here is on answering questions, that's what I do. I say, why, 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 why? And trying to anticipate the questions that my viewers, that you all will actually ask me in the comments and trying to answer as much of those as I can. So in general, this is, I think, a really good article for anyone who wants to do research to try and figure out when they're kind of done with the research or anyone that wants to make YouTube videos on technical content. I thought this was really great. He also has another blog post called What is Understanding? And I really recommend that one as well. I'll link that below. 
And I like that as well, combined with this what is research blog post, because again, I'm trying to help you all understand things about coding. So I'm trying to figure out how to connect the what is understanding with the how to research to put together a really good YouTube video. And again, I'm not always perfect and I may not answer everyone's questions all the time, but I'm trying my best. And this helps me get out content, you know, fairly regularly. So another thing I'm going through is actually two Udemy courses. One of the courses is actually on Vue, and I actually started trying to learn React, and that lasted for about a week, and I realized that for some reason my brain did not really understand React too much, and I had a lot of friends actually coding in Vue, so I decided to swap over and actually do Vue. But why is a backend engineer like me even learning Vue or any JavaScript technologies? Well, I personally have a goal where I wanna actually start building some full stack apps and I'm a backend engineer and I know that side really well. And I wanted to kind of figure out the MVP product where I could do the front end as well. Now, I'm not good at front end and I'm probably never going to enjoy it. It's just not my thing. It's a little bit different coding than I'm used to, but I wanna be competent at it and actually get to a place where I can actually build these apps. So I found this amazing Udemy course. It's actually pretty long and very well defined and actually covers Vue 2 and 3, I believe. It has both of those videos. So I'm able to go through all of that and actually start building my little projects along the way as I'm taking the course. And for courses like this, because I'm building something as I'm studying, I'm actually going through it kind of slowly. So I'm probably not gonna finish this very quickly. I could sit down and maybe watch all the videos, but again, I wanna build, so I'm kind of skipping around and learning different things. And for me, that's okay for this project. I, I enjoy that. I don't take notes in coding either, so I don't kind of have to keep writing things down or anything. This is really purely for fun, purely for me to build things. So along the way, I'm also using a bunch of different resources on Vue. Another course that I'm taking is actually this course on confidence by TJ Walker. And I really like this course. I actually take it a lot when I'm walking my dog or I'm getting my nails done, actually, because it's a really good podcasty course. And I, I have courses in my life, like ones that I really need to actually watch and concentrate on, like the V1, and kind of more the podcasty listening ones where it's a lot more talking, you don't need to look at the screen, but you can kind of think through it as you're going through the course. You know, I think confidence is something that a lot of people don't talk about much, but honestly, the reason I'm taking this course, and it sounds really stupid, but confidence is something that I think a lot of people don't have a lot of, and obviously, you know, being now on YouTube and social media, you know, you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself to create content. And sometimes I have doubts, just like any other person. But besides confidence, what I really like about this course is he actually talks about confidence in the term of being competent and achieving your goals. So for me, a long, long time ago, I wanna say about six years ago, I actually read this Medium post on doing a life audit. And me and a few of my friends, we actually spent the afternoon doing this exercise and actually writing down post-it notes of all the goals and all the dreams that we wanted to achieve. So I did that and then sorted all my goals and started really trying to complete these goals. So every quarter I actually look at my goal list and I organize them and say, what do I wanna complete in the next 12 weeks? What steps can I take towards my long-term goals? And some quarters and some years I had completely different focuses. So for me, six years ago, I was paying off student loans. So getting my life in order in the financial sense was something really important to me. So I spent 12 weeks learning a lot about savings, retirement accounts, index funds, and really concentrating on those goals. But now as time has moved on, you know, I have that in order, I have my finances in a good place and automated, I've now moved on to other goals. So, you know, some of my goals are like doing this YouTube channel and social media and trying to write more and learn front end like I'm doing. And this kind of helps me, you know, achieve my dreams in the end. So I still use this original Trello board that I made and I update it every quarter. But what I like about this course is it actually talks about confidence and goal setting in a little bit different ways. So this instructor has a little bit different approach to goal setting and he actually talks about the seven different habit spheres and the pieces of your life where you should set goals. Those seven spheres are self-control, agency, health, love, friendship, relationships, 
lifelong learning, creating, demonstrating purpose, leisure, and wealth. And along the way, in every goal category, you should have micro goals and long-term goals. And he divides those into seven parts as well. Those fears include your philosophy for life, your self-identity, you know, 10 second micro affirmation goals, some short-term goals, some long-term goals. And you can actually divide out your dreams into that way because you know even if you have a big long-term dream what step can you take today to really push you towards that vision or you know if you want to write a book one day and that's a long-term goal for you maybe your 10 second goal will just be to write a couple sentences write a couple ideas for a chapter or maybe a short-term daily core goal that you have is to write 500 words and you'll actually end up building towards that goal, that long-term goal without thinking it too much because you're building those habits. So I'm on that exercise right now and I actually really like it and I'm starting to build this out into a few categories that I really want to work on. So stay tuned for that. So a third thing I'm learning is actually looking at Go 1.17 and the new Google Cloud platform, Tau Chips. We had this totally weird thing happening at my work where I was running some code and the runtime scheduler was taking something like 10% of the total time when I was doing a performance profile. And the weird thing was we were looking at it and we were like, okay, let's drop down the number of instances and machines and CPUs and see what happens. And when we did that, for some reason, the runtime scheduler went to pretty much 0%. So what scheduling does is it assigns resources to perform tasks, which means in very simple programs, what will happen is you have one task, it runs that, then you have a second, then a third, and that just continues in serial. However, these schedulers are meant to make the most efficient use of the resources they have. That means they're also gonna take into account process priority. So maybe you have a few tasks with different priorities and maybe they all don't have to be done in serial. Maybe we can do the higher priority task first even though you know it was maybe later on the step and then schedule those out onto different cores. So I've been diving into hyperthreading and seeing if maybe for some reason the hyperthreading is actually causing slowdowns in performance and maybe you know more variable results. And as a customer, I'd probably rather have a little bit slower performance but more consistent results and I feel like that'd be less frustrating, right? If something took five seconds to load, but then it took five seconds to load 10 times and then 20 seconds to load the 11th time, I think that'd be more frustrating to me than something having taken 5.5 seconds, but 5.5 seconds every single time. So nearly all CPUs these days are multi-core, which means they have actually several processing units that can do different tasks. And what hyper-threading is, is actually an innovation where you can actually run multiple threads on one core. In theory, if you have more threads, you can do more work. So this means that a physical core may actually work like two logical cores and maybe be more efficient because you can technically run two tasks at once. So our working hypothesis here was because actually we had too many CPUs and too many logical cores running, for some reason that scheduler started thrashing. It didn't have enough work to do and it was trying to schedule things and move things around and actually spent a lot of time moving things around because it thought it would have a more efficient process elsewhere, but it actually didn't and it spent all that extra time just like trying to organize everything going on. So I've been reading about these new GCP Tau instances because we're actually moving more towards, first of all, cost and performance improvements there, but also that one CPU equals one core and we're not actually gonna be hyper-threading. So we definitely have a lot of experiments lined up here on the performance side to see if it actually helps either with performance, uh, we're hoping that will happen as well, but also with the stability. And also in the new release of Golang, it actually looks like we're gonna be moving from stack to register-based calling conventions, which means we're actually gonna get maybe a 6.5% improvement there in performance. So I'm also reading about that and pretty excited about that because you know what, I'll take a 6.5% performance improvement without doing anything. Another thing I've been reading is Matt Levine's Bloomberg opinion blog called Money Stuff. And it's released every day and it's actually really hilarious. It's a really easy read. It has some financial language, but it's not that flowery and over the top in legalese. And it's actually a really good introduction to what's going on right now in the crypto space or in that whole Robin Hood fiasco. For example, one of the things he says here, in 2018, Robin Hood briefly advertised fake bank accounts and got into hilarious trouble. 
Robinhood just spends a lot of its time living at the very edge of what is financially possible and legally permissible, and sometimes it gets in weird trouble for it. This makes it interesting. So I personally switched from Robinhood to Fidelity when the whole GME stuff was going on. I thought that shutdown was pretty wild. I already had a lot of my assets in Fidelity, but I had a few things going on with Robinhood because it was so easy. I was playing around with options, which, you know, is very dangerous. Don't do options on margin. So I've been learning a lot about the financial stuff and this vlog has been a fantastic overview of all things financial. So I recommend you all subscribing if you have any interest at all in the financial space. I think it's an awesome read. And the last thing I want to talk about is this paper I'm reading called The Power of Quantum Neuro networks. So this is actually a fairly new paper that came out and it talks about how well-designed quantum neural networks can actually have a speed up over classical neural networks. So in the quantum community, it's pretty well accepted that quantum machine learning is really not a very near-term application of quantum computing. While quantum machine learning can actually have a speed up over classical machine learning, it's going to be probably pretty limited. So I talked a little bit about quantum neural networks in one of my other videos and I linked a good review article there, but this one actually talks about quantum information matrices, quantum information, Fisher information matrices. So this is actually good for figuring out if a machine learning model is actually favorable or if it's going to lead to vanishing gradients or barren plateaus. This might be really useful for developing good quantum machine learning networks because it'll give us more of an intuition like we have for classical networks now. So these are the things I've been thinking about. And besides that, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos on true crime. I don't know why I'm into that lately, but that's what I'm spending a lot of my YouTube time on. And I'm actually starting to travel a lot more now that I have the vaccine. I'm also trying to write a book on coding and I actually want to build a few courses and I'm trying to balance all of that with my full-time job and keeping this YouTube active. So let me know if you liked this video, if you enjoyed seeing what I am learning and doing and give it a thumbs up if you did.